keep kind of propelling these ideas. And um, so like for me, in a, in a sense, even the online or the, the text to give thing, like, man, it, there, there are these things that we do that feel really bizarre to me. And we think that they're innovative. And I think they were innovative at some point, but we've, we just don't reevaluate. And so to have a conversation where we're evaluating some of the things that we're doing, you know, um, my biggest angst today is when I have a conversation that where the anti online people come at church, I will tell them the online experience is closer to church than what we get on an in-person gathering at a mega church. Often, like, I don't, like, I don't think we know how to have that conversation, but I feel like it's a really important conversation. Hey, Kingdom One family, thanks for showing up to another podcast. Today, our interview is with Matt Curtis, who is our Chief Development and Online Ministry Officer. He has 16 years of experience and uh, creative leadership and execution, and all of his experience is going to just come out today in this conversation around how can we pivot as an online church? How can we get the most engagement, and how can we think at a high level and execute in a real way to make sure that we're giving our congregations the best experience ever? Here's our interview with Matt Curtis. Welcome to the Kingdom One podcast, where we grow the church together. This podcast is here to give you big ideas and help you get practical with the tactical. Here's your host, Nico Valle. Hey, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today uh, on the Kingdom One podcast. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of your extracurricular activities? Because those are, uh, those sound really fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, over the years, there have been a lot of different things that I've chased down. I think um, one of the things I've always been really intrigued by is the power of a lot of these internet platforms that exist. And so some of them are super technical, you know, some of them um, are, you know, coding based or video driven, like YouTube channels or things like that. But a lot of them are just providing tools for common man to, to access that were really behind walls before. And so um, I've written a couple of different books and self-published them through Amazon. Uh, and I think what I love so much is that it gives you this platform to to write. So if you have ideas, if you have concepts that you think are important for the world to hear about, you can do that. You can write them down and you can distribute them to a super broad audience through Amazon. Or uh, some friends and I came up with a card game idea. And so I, I am a creative. And so I was like, this is going to be a fun product to illustrate. So illustrated it. And then we released it through Kickstarter. Um, again, like the, the, end, the, the barrier to entry for some of these things has been so high historically. You know, I don't have a contract with Hasbro or whatever these, you know, companies are distributing games. So we just did it. And I think that's kind of the power that the internet has has provided a lot of people is it's allowed them to just do some of these crazy ideas and then see if they work. Maybe they don't, and that's fine. Uh, but but it's been a ton of fun chasing a lot of these things down uh, over the years with some some with people. You know, have these kind of tight knit groups of people that have a crazy idea that's shared and they chase it down, or a harebrained scheme of your own. You know, and so it's been a it's been a fun kind of series of opportunities to chase these things down and then see what sticks. Yeah. And what I heard uh, is this not having a contract with Hasbro, which is really like this idea of we can go over the top. We don't have to say, hey, Hasbro or hey, um, you know, big denomination church. Can we actually have church? And I, I see you as a thinker and a doer, uh, which is really awesome. And so I, I would love to talk about online church. And specifically, I would maybe unpack this idea of um, there's really nothing holding us back. Like the technology is there. Can you maybe speak to that about like not having to have those contracts or permission to do do some of those things? Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think the, the extent of all these different side projects for me has almost been my internal struggle with permission. Um, I think I've lived a lot of my life anticipating permission, uh, waiting for permission, and even assuming that someone would give permission. Uh, and I think it's, it's, uh, it reminds me a lot of the Spider-Man meme where there's two Spider-Mans and they're both pointing at each other and like nothing's happening. They're just pointing at each other. Um, I think that's kind of what our world is right now. I don't think most of us, myself included, can even really fully grasp um, how little permission is needed anymore. And so um, really what I think is so beautiful about the opportunities of today for the church is that we actually have access to pretty much everything. There, there isn't this, there isn't this huge hurdle that's ahead of us 
Um, well, I mean, there are some in terms of our own kind of willingness to step into it, I guess, but, but really it comes down to what's your mission? Is your mission compelling? Is your mission big? And is your, is your mission uh, impactful to the world? Uh, because if it is, you, you have this almost this unlimited access to, to these tools that can really propel you forward. So, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's a big part of it is we've waited for a long time. You know, we've waited for permission or we felt like we had to build this big um, kind of agenda minded group toward accomplishing some task, you know, it takes years and years and years to, to build favor in a certain way or to influence a certain idea. But man, that's just not true anymore. I mean, if you have a compelling idea and you want to communicate it and you want to get it out there, the platforms are available for you to be able to distribute your message. So. Absolutely. I think that's really key is like, you don't have to sit around and wait for permission. Um, like if you have an idea, go out and test it. And I love what you said. Sometimes it's not going to work. Sometimes it might fail, uh, but that's really good for, for online ministry leaders to really put them in the mindset, especially if they're new to this. Um, so one thing I want to talk about, and, and I think you have a lot of insight in this coming from, from the online experience you have. Um, can you kind of give us some clarity around where you sit uh, with where online should be within the organization? Should it be a campus? Is it an extension of a broadcast campus? Is it a discipleship tool? Can you maybe talk us through how you see online best fitting into uh, a church? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think my answer would probably be just yes, generally. Um, I think uh, online provides a really unique opportunity for any organization. And then I would say any organization. I think where the, the lines are typically drawn uh, fall within this really kind of the, the organization of the church in this instance, but the church's theological position on a lot of the practices of the church. And so... Um, what I found is that many organizations are willing to just say kind of no across the board. Uh, obviously, this this era of of COVID and pandemic and stay at home and and all those types of things have forced us to reconsider um, how how much we're willing to dabble in this space. Um, I I look at I've actually been doing uh, some research lately on on how does how do, how do the letters in the New Testament function like what's the purpose of them and so. There's a lot of different things that I've that I've kind of seen. You know, just Paul communicating to churches for different purposes. The gathering is important and it's valuable. And actually, much of what's being communicated in the New Testament is toward protecting the gathering. So it's about address these theological issues so that the gathering can still happen in unity. Um, but there's a whole lot of stuff that's happening, leveraging what I would consider to be remote ministry. So I'm going to write this on a letter. I'm going to distribute it from afar. I'm not physically present. And then there are some needs that elevate to the point of Paul needed to come and he needed to go in person to try to resolve a dispute. But, but for me, the vast majority of what the church does can happen in an, uh, leveraging online as a platform um, for, for communication, for correction in some cases, for teaching, uh, there, there's just, there's just so many opportunities. And so I, I personally think it can function in, in, in most of those contexts. Um, I think what it, what it really comes down to, and this I think is the other really cool opportunity for, um, that the internet or really the on the online context provides us is all churches don't have to operate the same way in this space. And so there are going to be churches where leadership feels particularly compelled uh, to pursue evangelism. And so for them, the, the online ministry can be the front door. There are other churches that are going to say, you know what, the, the church is for the gathering of believers. And so their online ministry expression can really capture the teaching, uh, the sort of the deeper theological training, even those things are still valid, even though they're happening in an online context. And so um, I think I think it can be a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. And that's really what excites me so much about it is that the the challenge, I think, is not answering the question of yes or no. The challenge is how do we appropriately embrace online ministry in our context based on what we believe theologically and the mission that we're trying to accomplish as an organization? Yeah, I, I love what you said there about Paul being remote and distributing these letters, and it really brings a new insight to what technology really is. Like if you look at the Gutenberg Press, like that's a game-changing technology that allowed information to flow. Same thing with the internet, just game-changing technology that allows information to flow. And so yeah, I love and, what you, you, you said about on, that. On that. 
Yeah, on, on that point with the, the the Gutenberg press, there was resistance, like there was angst about it. There was there was disagreement as to whether or not this was good. Are we putting too much in the hands of kind of the common man? And so obviously there were some corruption issues. There were some some problems in that even that mindset. But but at the end of the day, technology has been resisted by the church. I mean, it's pretty much a historical pattern. And so there there's a there's a, a wisdom in a sense to question some of these things, but I think we hold on to resistance longer than we should. And so sometimes where we find ourselves is this isn't going away. And so I think that's the tension is you're going to have to answer this question. The, the internet's not going away. So now what? Are you going to disengage? Are you going to are you going to step out of kind of the normative experience of humanity for, for some reason? Or are you going to say, how do we instead embrace it wisely and, and leverage it for the mission that we're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when you say historically the church has been, you know, resistant to change, it makes me think of uh, some publications around the time that the bicycle comes out and that there was very heavy writings that the church said that the bicycle is going to disrupt um, the way that the church operates because people would rather be riding their bike. And so they encourage their congregations yeah. to walk. And this is kind of like this weird paradigm that churches have is that there is, there's a resistance built, built in somehow. Can you speak to how we can overcome that resistance mindset, um, specifically like in this COVID time and, and in these times where we have to be innovating at a very rapid high pace? Is there anything that you do or you encourage your teams to do in order to get over uh, the resistance? Yeah, I'm, I think the, the biggest thing for me, the starting point is, um, I think there has to be a calibration. Um, one of the things that often comes up in this space is I don't understand enough. Um, I don't, I don't live in this space enough. I'm not native enough. And so for me, I actually always go back to the fact that, um, people being saved is not, um, is not conditional on us in the sense that if the spirit decides to move, then the spirit decides to move. And so God is sovereign, God is king, and God is working in a way that he sees fit. Uh, so, so for me, I have a very high view of the sovereignty of God, and that's critical for me when I begin any new venture, any new, um, uh, new thought process, or even any new experimentation in terms of how do we present the message of the gospel in an online context. At the end of the day, it's up to God to work. If he chooses to work, then it doesn't matter what I do. <laughs> if he doesn't choose to work, then it doesn't matter what I do. And so the baseline for me is I'm going to lean in and I'm going to try to be faithful. I'm going to try to be faithful to God's word, to God's call in my life, and really to the Great Commission. I want, I want to see people come to know Jesus. Uh, and so because I'm resting in the fact that everything doesn't hinge on my expertise or on my knowledge or on my team's ability to execute. Like all of a sudden now we can make, make mistakes and still trust that God's working. We can put out a product that may not be where we want it to be and recognize that we're not, we're not undermining the kingdom. And so there's a, there's a baseline there for me and for my team that says, oh, okay, we're in a safe space now in the sense that we can, we can pursue the gifts. We can, we can leverage the gifts and the skills that God has given us to begin trying to figure out how do we present the message of the gospel well, but we don't have to worry about everything coming back on us. So that's the big thing for me. That's the first thing is just understand who God is and understand who we are. And that divide is huge. But it gives me a sense of peace. It gives my teams a sense of peace. And hopefully it gives everybody listening or watching a sense of peace that, that there, is, there is a God of the universe who is working on our behalf, really on his own behalf, to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So there's that side of it. And then from there, it just comes down to, well, what are you comfortable with? What's a good starting point for you? Um, I think we get so enamored with these churches that have tremendously high skill set. And man, I'm thankful that there are, there are Christ followers who are investing their skills and their talents in these spaces for the church on behalf of the church. That really encourages me and excites me. Um, but that's not everybody's situation. You know, if you're a church of 50 people, you're not going to be able to put on the same production or the same um, kind of caliber of execution that a church of, you know, 10,000 or 50,000 or whatever is going to be able to do just from a budget constraint alone. And so don't try to be those churches. Uh, it really does become, how do I leverage what I have? You know, I, think, I think throughout scripture, there's so many examples of it's not about who gives the most in terms of numerical value, but it's who gives 
uh, sacrificially. And so you look around and you think, well, what is it that we do have to work with? Maybe all you have is a phone. Maybe you don't even have a phone that does video. So you can buy a cheap video camera. You can, you know, use a, a lapel mic. I just saw the other day a USB lapel mic came out. You know, they, there's all these things that that you can use that really aren't breaking the bank, but it's you pursuing um, whatever it is you're comfortable with, whatever it is you're capable of, and you take your first step. And what happens is, and this is this is where for me all of these kind of side ventures have really culminated in my thinking around this space. I started with with really low end stuff. I didn't have a microphone. Like I wasn't using a mic. I was using my phone. That's all I was. That's all I had. Uh, and so I was actually struggling because the first iPhone didn't even have video capacity or you know capability. And so I'm using this like super janky little thing that I bought for a hundred bucks, and it's you know supposedly an HD cam, but it was horrible. <laughs> but but you know what it did is it unlocked my ability to have ideas in my head, translate them into something that somebody else could watch. Now whether people loved watching it, I don't know. But but what it did is it got me in the door. It broke down that barrier of I can't create and it and it shifted me now into this space of you know what I can create and then from there I said you know what? I need to start improving different little pieces one at a time and I did and it built over time and so just start where you are start somewhere and understand that God's the one who's working and so that's kind of the twofold you know angle for me I don't want to get caught up and I don't have enough and I don't want to caught up in thinking that if I if I miss um the highest mark I have in my head, then God won't work. Neither of those things are true. God will That's work. So good. Start where you are. That is so good. I, I love how it's like you calibrate and you kind of rest in the fact that God's going to do what God's going to do, but you also create. So it's like this tension that, you know, you, you have faith, but you also have to kind of do the work and, and get down there. And, and that was, you, you really answered this question, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask it um, anyway, uh, because I felt what you just said answered this question, but what would you say to that that church that's just started out streaming in COVID-19 and the team is struggling and the pastor might be struggling because they're not seeing the the ROI that they expected right off the bat. Can you potentially speak to that? What encouragement would you give? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I usually, I usually, as I'm, as I'm starting a project, I, I have these kind of aspirations. So the, the card game is a good example with Kickstarter. We didn't really know what it was going to yield. And so we set we set two goals. The first goal as a team was, and there were three of us that were involved. The first goal was we want to make enough profit to be able to buy ourselves a hamburger at five guys for, for each of us. So, I mean, we're talking, I don't know, maybe 50 bucks. <laughs> so, so that's our goal. We're, we're investing hundreds of hours and our goal is to buy, you know, buy hamburgers for each of us. And then our next goal was to make enough to be able to pay off our mortgages. So obviously those are wildly, you know, there's a huge gap, but what we did is we set a bar that was attainable. Um, and so I think, I think really what it comes down to is have realistic expectations. Um, I think it's fair to recognize that this season is not ideal for anybody. Um, you know, I would never encourage a church to jump into online, online ministry as a reaction. That's not typically the best posture to jump into any new venture. Um, and so understand that we were forced into this situation. And in a lot of ways, we weren't able to prepare as much as we would have liked to. And then what that does is that gives us a sense of, um, there's almost this like adrenaline rush in the beginning where it's like, man, this is crisis. I'm going to solve problem. But then you realize that how you solve the problem isn't good for the long haul. You know, if your car breaks down, let's say you have a flat tire, you figure out a way to get you, to get you back home, you know, it's two miles away. That's a solution that solves getting you back home, but it doesn't set you up successfully for a road trip. And all of a sudden we've discovered we're on a road trip and it's like, oh, I'm 500 miles from home and I don't have the, the correct, you know, the correct setup to be able to get me to, to where I'm going. So, so there's a lot of things in this situation where I think first, like respect the fact that it's real, that you're fatigued, like that's okay. This has been a long and awkward season. It's been complex. It's been painful. Um, there, there have been a lot of hardships in the midst of this. So yes, 100%. Um, but I really do think the beginning of this is to acknowledge that and to accept that that's real and that that's okay that that's real. Um, and then I think the next step is really, you know, similar to understanding that God's sovereign. Um, recalibrate again. Recognize that what scripture calls us to is to be faithful. That's what scripture calls us to. And so um, if you're given a situation where you're not getting the results that you think that you would like to be getting, uh, ask yourself the question if you're being faithful or not. 
Um, not to say that no results means not faithful either. That's I think that's really the point of this is that your faithfulness is what's being evaluated. That's what that's what your call is for. You know, I've heard I've heard stories. There's one in particular of a, of a missionary in the Congo. Um, he was a doctor, quit his job, went to the Congo, and was pursuing ministry. Um, he ended up having an argument with one of the tribe leaders, left the town, and essentially was off the mission field. And so, in his mind, he was a failure. He he had a a rift uh, relationally, and it pulled him out of the mission field. Well, 50 years later, a group of people go and they think that this is an unreached people group. So they're they're walking through the jungle, they get to this clearing and they see something and they're super confused, like super confused. They're like, that looks like a cathedral. I don't understand what we're seeing right now. And so they begin having these conversations with the local people. And it turns out this person who had had a relational rift felt like he was bearing no fruit, felt like there were no results that were happening. He had actually left a legacy of Christ followers there who had continued pursuing Christ and been evangelizing to to tribes all around in the local area. And so they, they ended up building a building and it didn't hold enough people. And so they each village had to begin building their own, you know, their own uh, churches. And it's like, all of a sudden now, what looks like we're not doing effective work, we have no idea. And I don't, you know, it's so, so I think there's, there's really this, this season right now is one where the church isn't being blessed with the fruit that's visible in a way that we would like it to be. And I think that's, that's probably the thing for me that I'm really holding on to more than anything. I mean, we've had stories in, in our own church and working in at High Desert Church where we've had uh, people who have come to know Christ they have asked to become, they, they want to get baptized and they have pursued membership. They actually came to an in-person membership class that we had during this very small window in California where we were open again. And I think what it did is it really confronted the understanding of what this online ministry stuff is about. We think that it's for lazy people. We think that it's for people who don't feel like waking up in the morning or whatever it is. But the reality is that people are actually recognizing their need for Christ, they're, they're watching and participating in a meaningful way. And I think more important than any of that, the spirit is still working and is still active and is calling people to himself. And so, you know, sorry that you don't have the feedback that you normally do of, you know, people showing up in your auditorium or the voices of people singing. That's hard. It legitimately is. But man, God is still working. And so trust that this is a season where your faithfulness is the thing that you get to invest in. And, and it's going to be faithfulness maybe without the feedback that you've had, you know, but, but keep going because God is still working. That is so good. I love that story that you told. And even just before when you're talking about um, this idea of having, uh, you know, putting in work that's going to get you maybe like $50 in return for hundreds of hours. But then right after that, you said, you know, the next step is to, to think about paying off a mortgage. And so what I'm hearing is there's a disproportionate amount of work, but there's also a tipping point. There's a point where this work is actually going to make sense. And you kind of, uh, like uh, e equated it a, a bit in that story to like planting a seed and then that grows over time. It's not going to be immediate feedback. So I love that line of thinking of we sometimes have to wait and sometimes we're, you know, maybe getting paid 50 bucks for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. But there's a tipping point to where this is going to leave a legacy in and of itself. So that's really, really important. Yeah, and um, I think... I think one of the things real quick that that is going to be um, a really powerful realization uh, that the trends in the United States were already pointing towards fewer and fewer people attending church. And so, I mean, just just understand that the fact that people aren't in church buildings, obviously there's a pandemic that's preventing that, but that was the trajectory already. And so I think one of the things that's going to be particularly powerful is when we are able to gather again. I think that we're going to be surprised at how significant we acknowledge the gathering is. And so I know that the, the, the conversations, at least prior to COVID, and I think they're probably continuing um, you know, during the season, but um, the conversations in the online ministry space really were about the gathering is still important. But that was an argument. That was a battle. That was something that was happening in that space, conversations that were happening. But I think it's been so interesting for me to watch in the online space how much that group is almost becoming more outspoken, that that is a critical component to our growth uh, and our pursuit of Christ. And so I think what's going to happen is that 
we're in this season of planting seeds right now. And I think when the doors open up again, I think there's the potential for us to then begin seeing the fruit of a lot of the investment that we made. That is awesome. That is fantastic. Um, I, I love what you talked about. You know, there's a fruit to an investment and I, I kind of want to switch gears on, on that note, um, talking about um, what is required, what is the investment and why money matters for online ministry. And I, I think, you know, coming from, from doing online for, for quite some time, you might have some insight of, of why does money matter for an online church? Isn't it something that can just be like super low bar and, and, and can be done for almost nothing? Can you maybe speak to that, that thinking? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's two things, you know, as I'm, as I think through this question, I think the first is that, um, the, the opportunity to give is actually a very important part of your faith. And so I've, I've found that as I've had conversations about giving, there are two, there are two camps that people land in. They either land in, um, the tithe is biblical. And so we should be giving 10% or they land in the tithe is not a, a biblical kind of a new Testament directive, but we should be generous, which is even more than a tithe. So uh, there, there haven't been, uh, I don't know actually if I've ever talked to anybody who has said that giving is a critical component or they've, if they've said that it's not a critical component of somebody's faith. And so in part, the reason that money is important is because it's, a, it's actually a, a really important part of our, of our walk. And so to be able to have that and facilitate that in the online context is, is important because it's continuing that practice even when we're unable to gather. But in terms of investing in, in, the, in the quality of the work that we're doing, you know, I always look at this bar, and this is true across the board for me. This is a verbal truth. Like if I'm having a conversation with you, I'll do this actually. Um, let's say that I come out and I tell you that, man, I am a huge Biden supporter. Well, certain people would be like, oh, I can't believe it. Or if I said, you know what, I'm actually, I'm actually a super big Trump guy. Well, all of a sudden half, you know, not maybe half the group, I guess now looking at the numbers, but there's a portion of people who will respond to that and they'll react. And, and, and what happens is now, no matter what I say, after that statement, you're going to be disengaged. And so there are these barriers to entry of understanding. So let's say I have a really good suggestion for you, but you don't care about my political alignment. You disagree passionately. Well, now you're going to miss the fact that I actually have really good advice, objectively good advice. And so similarly, as we're presenting the message of the gospel online, there's actually a point where people struggle to engage. They, they struggle to remain connected in terms of the content that's being presented. And so this isn't about, oh, we're competing with Netflix or, oh, we're con competing with Disney Plus. This isn't, this isn't about how to make your content as showy as possible. Instead, it's about understanding the context in which your, your content and your material is being presented. And so you want to present it in a way that is, um, you know, minimal distraction, um, high enough quality where people can actually participate and really allow that to fade away. You don't want, you know, is there a buzz or a hum in the background or is there, a, you know, are there dogs barking or like what's going on? You know, it's all of those types of things. They just, add, they make it harder for people to engage and to hear the message that's being preached. And so that's really where as you pursue better quality, um, it, it really does pay dividends in the sense that you're going to be presenting a product that's going to be easier for people to engage. Yeah. And as you talk about giving is an important uh, part of our walk, can you talk to us about, um, you know, what are some best practices for online giving? You know, is there anything that you can think of for that church leader who is, you know, just started and you're like, we haven't even asked for a tithe online or an offering online. What are, what are some practical things that they could do um, to, to make that well received? Yeah, you know, giving in the church for me has always been about tying your, your ask to vision. Like I, I need to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and I don't mean you have to have some compelling, you know, some compelling, um, you know, we're going to build 17 buildings in 17 years kind of a thing. I mean, that's, that's helpful if you have that kind of a vision. Um, that's a good reminder to keep in front of people. But really, I think um, I, I feel like the church today often misses the opportunity to remind the Christ follower uh, as to why they're doing what they're doing. I don't think I've, I've actually been in a church service in the last, I don't know, maybe decade where I've actually been reminded as to why I'm gathering in person. It's just sort of a, yep, everybody should do it and like keep doing it. 
And then occasionally we'll have a series in Hebrews and that verse will come up and everybody will be like, oh yeah, it's important that we're doing it. But I'm never really reminded of the practices that I'm doing. You know, even with giving, it's often, hey, now we're going to take our tithes and offerings. We're going to sing a song or have a soloist and then they're going to do a thing. And it's like, I mean, that's great. But like, if you, if you sit for a second and you ask yourself, why am I doing this again? I think that's really where the church steps in and helps people understand the practices of the church and why they matter. And so I'm not going to sit here and argue for liturgy necessarily, but I think that's one of the powerful elements that a very liturgical approach to ministry has, is it reminds you regularly why you're doing what you're doing. And so I think when you're asking for money, when you're, when you're asking for people to participate in being generous, um, even in an online context, you're reminding them that you're not saying, hey, guys, sorry, the lighting's so bad. Will you help us pay for it? That's not what people are doing. They're not exchanging money for increased experience. That's a that's a kind of a terribly transactional view of what a tithe is. Really, it's this is a spiritual thing for you. This is a way for you as the Christ follower to let go of your kind of enslavement to money and instead saying, no, I serve God. I trust that he provides. He's good. He is king. And so there's very much this process that I think we need to be walking our people through, helping them understand the role that happens. And so, you know, I've heard churches that will come up with slogans or, or phrases that really say, you know, this glorifies God, or we're doing this because we are saying that we trust in God's provision for us. Those are things that are so important to help people understand the context in which we're giving and why we're doing this. So I think that's the, that's really the big thing for me is, man, you got to, the way I would say it, is you, you got to attach it to the to the vision. You know, you got to attach it to the to the vision and also the mission. Why are you as a Christ follower doing any of the things that you're doing? Hopefully you're trying to put yourself in a better position to be a light to the lost world. You're trying to grow closer to God. You're trying to to do those things. Um, and this is one practice that helps propel you in that way. Yeah, that's very, very good is is having it be vision centric uh, always is yeah. going to help because people give to vision. Um, they don't necessarily give to us uh, like a, a fog machine or new lighting or any of right. those things. And sometimes that's appropriate. I mean, you do have to have capital sure. campaigns for buildings and, and, and such. Um, but can you maybe talk us through what are some of the practical um, things like are there are there like giving apps are there are certain things that that you do uh, and that you encourage your teams to do um, to actually facilitate a good giving experience? Yeah. You know, the kind of the overarching philosophy for me is, you know, again, I, I always kind of go back to this, like, just look around, you know, I think, I think there's something that um, there's something to be said for innovation and being on the bleeding edge of technology, the bleeding edge of development, all those kinds of things. I think there's something that's really important that, that happens there. Um, but at the end of the day, look around, look at how you paid for the cheeseburger that you got for lunch, or look at how you ordered a salad to be delivered to your house. What is the normative behavior of people culturally? And I, I would call it, what is the language that our people speak? You know, I often use the analogy, um, if, if the government decided that our national language was going to be French, what would happen? All of our churches would, one, learn French, and then two, we would translate all of our materials into French. Um, at some point, we would start preaching in French, and we would probably sing in French, would be my guess. Well, we, we need to understand the language of our people. And so the language of our people isn't writing checks nearly as much as it is using like Venmo or, you know, using app driven, you know, payment processing or things like that. Even credit cards. This is one that always drives me nuts <laughs> and I'll get on a soapbox, but I don't understand why I can't pay for a credit card or pay with a credit card for every single thing that the church does. Like, I don't get it because everywhere else in my life, that's what happens. And so it's those kinds of things where the church is a disconnect in a lot of ways. Now I get we're supposed to be separate from culture and all those things, but I don't think using the same currency as everyone else means that we're somehow, or, you know, not, not using the same currency somehow means that we're separate in like a holy way. It means we're just really hard to engage. <laughs> so, so those are the kinds of things for me. And so what's, what's really cool about this, um, this era that the church is in, there are a ton of organizations or companies that are developing different giving platforms or tools that work in almost any context. And so you have, you have 
companies giving companies that will give you an app. You have companies that have hyper mobile optimized giving platforms so that you don't even need an app. Um, but you can integrate things on your website. I mean, there's text to give. I mean, I don't, I've never purchased anything via text. So that one's foreign to me in a lot of ways, but it's an option that makes it easy for people to interact and to give. And so that's really my baseline is like find something that, um, that allows people to give in the way that they normally kind of spend their money, you know? And so you don't even have to get into unconventional stuff like, you know, having cars donated or property or stocks. I mean, you can, you know, you could dig into those spaces, but just to facilitate normal giving uh, is a really, I think a really easy and straightforward thing to do. And I think there's value in it uh, because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're removing barriers for people uh, in terms of, uh, of a path to entry in terms in this, in, in this instance, in particular with giving something that's a, that's a really growth filled activity for them. You know, think about how easy do you try to make it for small groups or to sign up for your events? Well, you try to make it easy because those are things that are important to your ministries. Well, giving is important for the growth and development of the Christ follower. And so focus on making it, making it, um, not unnecessarily complex. I'll say it that way, you know, because you still want it to be thoughtful and you want it to be a part of their spiritual growth. Um, but making it unnecessarily complex doesn't make sense. And so the good news is there's, there's tools, you know, there's a ton of tools that will facilitate that for you. Yeah. I think, uh, you hit it right on the head, like looking at what culture does and in, in translating that for your church. And so I think that's 100% you know, and I think back in 2003 to 2009, text to give was something that was kind of smart because you have these long URLs that you would have to like, how are you, we going to get people to remember this? We'll text this number. And I think technology has come so far uh, with, you know, app processing and then, you know, uh, like things like Cash App and Venmo and Apple Pay. It just kind of makes sense. That's how I pay for my coffee every morning is I just use my yeah. Apple Pay. And I would love to do that with the church as well because it's like literally one click of a button. Um, and so I think, I think you're right. And that's why sometimes I have beef with text to give because it feels like it's another step, you know, mm -hmm. it made sense maybe a decade ago, but I'm not sure if it still makes sense now. So I appreciate you saying that, that, that kind of reaffirms something that I, <laughs> I believe in the online space. So I appreciate that. And whenever you want to get on a soapbox, feel free, because I feel yeah. that whenever you like start to, to just go and, and I'm not saying like you rail against uh, the system, but I think there's some things within the the Christian system that can be spoken to and enlightened. And so I appreciate you, you, you doing that. My final question for you today is um, what would you tell that pastor, that ministry leader um, that's burned out and wants to get back to that in-person worship as soon as possible? How, how would you encourage them? And, and this whole conversation has been an encouragement, but what is that one thing that you want them to walk away with today? Yeah, I would, I would just reiterate, remember that your pursuit is to be faithful. Um, you know, faithfulness doesn't always come with the immediate reward. That's not what happens. You don't, you know, you don't preach a sermon and the whole congregation comes to know Christ. You know, I've, I've shared many messages where I am anticipating that the content will be impactful. And I walk away thinking, I'm not sure anybody even heard that, but it's not my job to, to do all of the work. My job is to be faithful. And so there's that side of it. Um, so I, you know, I would say, keep going, keep, keep pursuing, um, what you're able to pursue and, and trust that God will make up the gap. I mean, that's what his word tells us is that when we're weak, he's strong. And so in a lot of ways, you're exactly where a fruitful ministry <laughs> is described for you to be. Um, the other thing I would say too, though, is don't let, um, don't forget that you still have the opportunity to minister to people. I think that's been missed a little bit in this era. I think we've assumed that we can't minister to people if we're not physically present. Uh, but, but I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to virtually herd a large group of people, but we're missing the fact that we actually have the ability to still connect on a one-on-one -on -one level. And I think that's where the most kind of potent ministry happens. Um, so call people, you know, go through, go through your, your ledger or your database or whatever it is that you have that you're keeping track of people in your, in your congregation and call people. I mean, call them every week, you know, go through a rotation where you're calling five people every week or something, but, but don't, don't be content to let a season of physical separation prevent you from doing what you still can do, which is to reach out and to make personal connections. Cause at the end of the day, 
when you meet somebody on a Sunday and you say hello and shake your hand, your conversation is very brief, typically. Uh, maybe you see them again midweek for a program that happens on your church's campus. Uh, but ultimately, it's personal relationship that you're looking for. And nobody's been critical of phone calls for the last however long it's been since people have been <laughs> leveraging those, you know. So reach out to people and and take advantage of those opportunities to still um, to still interact. I mean, the other thing that you can do if you're very, very, very um, kind of missing seeing people in person, go to somebody's house and talk to them from the driveway or something, you know, do a drive-by thing where they come out on their front porch and you talk to them from your car. Like there's still opportunities. I think that's the thing that's been, been interesting to me is I feel like we've kind of thrown the baby out with the bathwater in a lot of these different restrictions. There's still, I mean, there are churches doing drive-throughs where they'll just pray for people. They'll just say hello. I mean, just hello. Hey, it's good to see you. I miss gathering with you and seeing you on a weekend, but it's good to see you. So there's still a lot of opportunities, um, a remarkable amount, I would say, that still exists for us to be connecting. And so I, I recognize the elephant in the room is like, how do we get our online ministry working? But to be honest with you, I think the most effective online ministry is the one that's that's actually mostly offline. <laughs> you know, preaching a message on the weekend, it's just if you're if you're viewing your weekends as a place where come and hear you uh, where people come and hear you lecture, you're missing what the church actually is. So so don't try to do that online as well. It's way, the biblical church is so much more robust than a lecture from a stage. So so don't be content to try to replace that digitally, but but figure out other ways to make the church be the church in an unconventional way for a season. But yeah, initiate one on one conversations, call people, visit people, you know, keep a distance or whatever, you know, however you guys feel comfortable about it. But but there's still a ton of opportunities to connect with the body of Christ. Yeah, that's so good. I love the idea that this is not just a lecture and this is not replicating something that happens on stage on a weekend. Uh, I, I normally talk to my teams and I tell them, hey, whatever we do in an auditorium or whatever we do in a, in a uh, like the, the sanctuary space, it's actually flipped and reversed online. Like it's, it's, it's a completely different model. You, ha you want people talking during the message online to show that they're engaged. So there's so many nuances there. Um, you know, then I think you hit right on the head. Like you, it's really about connecting with people and uh, a great online ministry is one that can happen offline as well. So I think that is fantastic. Matt, thank you so much for, for hanging out today. How can people get a hold of you? How can uh, people find more of your work and, and the things that you do? Uh, yeah, probably the easiest way is uh, go to my website. It's mcurtis.co. Um, I have a podcast that I um, sometimes record, <laughs> and when I do, it ends up there. Um, or you can follow me on uh, social media. It's at mcurtis underscore co on uh, either Twitter or Instagram. And yeah, that's pretty much the best way to to connect. Awesome. That's so good. Guys, thank you so much for listening today. If you want to get even more resources uh, out of, you know, a podcast like this and, and things that you're doing on your online church and, you know, uh, things for your church, you can go to kingdomone.co slash resources to get those resources today. They're free. It's an easy way for you to get wins under your belt. Uh, and that's a way that you can connect with Matt and myself if you need anything for your church. Um, so until we chat again, thank you so much and have a great week.